All right, so this is going to pick up where we left off. We had just got done talking about setting up the database, making sure that um, we have the, the new tables using the schema file that we created, and we kind of committed and pushed everything in out there at the very end. So I think the last thing we talked about too was in the readme, make sure that you note these two commands as you'll need them when you build out the readme for your final or your uh, mini project three. So we'll continue on to blueprints and views. And a blueprint itself is just a way to organize a group of related views. Now, a view itself is how you are asking for a given URL, right? So if I go to fhsu.edu slash informatics, for example, that slash informatics is going to pull up a view in the code on the backside when it, if you were to use Flask. And so that view is going to have things like a HTML git and an HTML post. A git is when I'm retrieving the page and a post is when I'm sending information back to that page. On there, inside of that, you're also going to be able to do all the logic that happens when you ask for the page um, where it retrieves things from the database, builds the web page for you, and then presents it to you. Or on a post, we're sending form data back to the server to crunch or add to the database, it performs those tasks and then gives you back a, another Git that or a, uh, a return page that would say, you know, thank you for your submission and it's been added to the database, something like that. So that's what we're building out with views. And a blueprint is a collection of those. So it would make sense to collect certain ones. For example, we're gonna deal with some authentication stuff here. So that's gonna be in the authentication blueprint, which handles all the authentication things that would need to be in there. Then we'll build out another blueprint that has another collection of views that makes sense. So it's a way to compartmentalize that data. So the first thing we're going to do is build out an auth file and we need authentication for two functions. One, we need it to um, be able to handle signing users into the system. And we also need them to be able to register within the system. So the first thing we're going to do is create a auth file underneath of our flask R here. So let's do a new Python file and auth. Okay. And of course, we're going to want to add this in and we're going to copy this code that we have here. We'll talk about that just a little bit here. So this is mostly just bringing in um, the basics that we need for this particular page. So we're going to have our function tools. We're going to from Flask itself, we're going to import our blueprint that we talked about, along with some other uh, different modules that we're going to need, or in this case, different functions we're going to need um, within this. You're going to pull in this work Zoog security. This is going to allow us to do some password checking. So we never want to store passwords. We just store the hashes and we're going to check given passwords against given hashes, et cetera. What's really nice is if you move your mouse over these, like you see here, it's going to fetch the documentation for that particular one. So it's a great way to read what is that module used for. Just kind of mouse over the top of that given module. And then you can see all the documentation that's associated with that one. The main line that we're working on here is blueprint, right? So this blueprint, we're going to set up an auth blueprint. And the URL that we're affixing this to is anything that is slash auth, right? So now that we have that part set up, we need to set up um, and update our init file so that we register this blueprint as part of our project. So we'll go back to our init file. And then down here at the very bottom, after we've done the database, we're going to go ahead and add these lines, which will make sure that we register this new auth blueprint with our setup. You see that right here. And again, these are always done at the bottom. Normally, as you guys have always heard from me, always do your imports at the top. Well, it's a little bit different in Flask because this is one of the last things we do before we actually return the application and start submitting things out to the end user um, when it's running live. So a little bit different than what we would normally do in the in the other class. All right, so now that we have our auth blueprint set up here, we need to set up our first view within there. And this first one is gonna be the register. This is gonna allow the users to register for service. Um, so we're gonna copy out this code. And again, we'll talk about that here in just a second. There's lots of components to that. So a view is basically a chunk of code that looks like this. 
And that's going to say, what route am I doing? So if I go to slash register, I, that is this particular view, execute this function, and it's going to go ahead and go on down. The methods we accept for this particular one are get and post, which is similar to what I just said before. Um, and it's always set up in this fashion, meaning we always check to see if the user is posting data to us. Remember, that's filling out a form and submitting. They click the submit button. If they are doing that, we want to crunch that data right away. If they are not doing a post, aka they're just going to this URL to get the website, then it's going to be a get, in which case here we're going to render the template to them, which is auth register.html. Right? And we'll talk more about that template here as we're going to modify that. Inside this post, we have two things. We have a form that has a username and a password. We're going to pull that out of the request. So request is an object that when you submit a form, you have the request. And that has all the information that was in the form. It comes in as this request object. So we'll request.method, if that's post, we're going to do request form, and we're going to grab the username out of the form and store that as a variable called username. Same thing for password. From there, we're going to go get access to the DB, which is our database. So we have DB equals get DB. Remember, that's the one that we created uh, yesterday, Monday. If we go back here. That's going to get us a connection to the database itself. Make sure everything's up and working. Once we have that and there's no errors, then we can go ahead and set this. So if there is no username that came back out of the form, we can give an error that the username is required. If there's no password, there's a password required. If the error is none, meaning we didn't catch any of these two errors, then we're going to go ahead and try to execute into the database, inserting user, username and password, the values that we pulled back from this table. And this is standard SQL syntax here. Um, and we're going to plug in our variables. We're going to have the username we put in. Note that we are not plugging in the password, that we're actually going to pass that to the function generate password hash. Then that hash is what we're storing in the database, not the actual plain text password. Then we're going to go ahead and try to commit those changes to the database. If all goes well, then we'll go ahead and um, return back to this uh, URL. If it did not go well, and we accept on a database integrity error, in which case, if you remember, username had a flag that said it had to be unique, right? So if we go back and look at our schema, we can see that our username had this unique flag. So if we're trying to submit somebody that is already in the database, that's going to generate an integrity error out of the database. And therefore, we're going to error and not actually commit this stuff to the database. Um, else, okay, we our commit went through, everything seems to be working great. We're going to go ahead and return our um, URL for the auth.login. And this is what we're going to return back to the user and say, redirect them to the login page at that point. All right. So that's all of what this is flowing through on the backside. And again, it's going to give you some details of all of that over here on the left. Then we need to create that login page for the user. So let's go ahead and create that login view. Remember, we want two blank lines and then we can go ahead and plug it in. So we're gonna copy this out here. And for the login page, it's basically doing the same thing. Only now, instead of trying to enter it into the database using this DB execute here, where we're inserting it into the database, we're going to pull the username and password they typed into the form. We're going to get connection to the database and we're going to execute a select, which makes sure that it exists in the database. If it does not have an error, notice we're only going to fetch one result. We should only get one result. Um, if the error of the user is none, then we have no an incorrect username. It's not the database. For the password we pull in from the user, that is plain text. And so we're going to take that plain text password, run that through the password hash by pulling the password hash out of the database. We're going to pass that in and generate the user password that came in and see if that matches the password that is in the database hash. So we're never storing again it in the, in the database. It's always going to be encrypted as a hash. But when we submit the form, that is actually in plain text. So because this is an HTTP website, we're technically submitting plain text up to the server itself. Not a great thing. We'd have to fix that later on if this was going in production. 
All right, so we're checking for the username, password, and then down here at the bottom, if there is no errors, we're going to go ahead and uh, clear our session. So if you guys are familiar with websites, you always have sessions and cookies. This allows us to set a state or a cookie in the browser that says you are logged in. And so we are going to clear the session and then set up a session ID with the user ID from the database itself. And then from there, we're going to go ahead and redirect them to the index or the main page for our project. Otherwise, if they're not posting this information, they're just going to the login page. We're going to go ahead and render them the HTML template for logging in. How is that on explanation for both of you? Is that too quick? Do I need to go into more detail there? That's okay. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see here. Next session that we're going to set up in auth is a function to set up the cookie and make sure that that user is logged in. So we're going to make sure that uh, before they get access to that page, they're actually logged in. Um, so this function is going to get the user session ID and if it finds an ID, it maps it over to a user. If it cannot map it over to a user, um, it clears the session cookie. Likewise, that makes sure that we have a logged in user. We also have a function here that will make sure that we can log them out. So if they go to slash logout, that is going to make sure that they clear the session cookie and then return them back to the main page. All right. If we want to require authentication on other views, making sure that they have to be logged in, uh, we need to have login required, and that's going to take in whatever view that you are looking for and making sure that they have that G user set. And then, of course, send them back to the login screen if not. So we're going to copy that in here. It's pretty easy. We would do that on our blog posts. So if we are asking them to edit, we would obviously have to make sure they're um, logged in. If they're not logged in, then we won't render the option for them to be able to edit the blog post. They would just see it. So we, we within the template, we can say, if you're logged in, get this HTML code. If you're not logged in, you get this HTML code. That's what this function here is doing with login required. And we call that a decorator. So this decorator is going to be put into our HTML code when we render. And if, again, if the user's logged in, we give them this HTML. If they're not, we give them a different HTML. Okay. Last but not least, um, this URL four is looking for the URL of our auth.login. So instead of actually giving them the URL of um, jasonzeller.com slash login, that is going to automatically be generated by this program. So it's going to know in our views when we set all this up, how this gets translated across. And we'll talk about this more here in the next section when we um, start setting up our URLs and endpoints. All right, so this next piece is gonna be our templates, right? So our templates, we talk about three of them in here. We have our register.html, we have our login.html, and we have our index page that we've been creating that we would start the whole project out at um, or that we would redirect them to once they've logged out or they logged in, et cetera, they would all go to this index page. So we got to create those templates that go through there. And there's a couple different templates that we're going to create. One, we're going to have our base template. So as I mentioned before, every HTML page is going to have this base template. And the benefit of that is, is we can put all of our header information in our footer information, and that is going to be consistent on every single page. And then we can always change the local content, the, the block that we call it in the middle. They can add that in as they need to for every single page. So to create our templates, we need to come up here to Flaskar and we're going to create a templates folder. And remember that we're creating this inside Flaskar because this is a self-contained package. So anything that deals with this Flaskar app needs to be inside this Flaskar folder. So inside that templates folder, we're now going to create a base HTML file. And thankfully, PyCharm can recognize HTML. So we're just going to call this base. That automatically gives us the base HTML. All right. We're going to go ahead and add that as well.
Now, before I go too much further, let's go ahead and get and commit all of this. So over here, we're going to say we have created the auth blueprint and associated views. Go ahead and commit that. And we have pushed it. Okay, great. So here's our base HTML code. And this is where all your INF 250 skills come back into play. You'll need to know how to do HTML. Now, this is going to look a little goofy compared to what HTML you're normally used to. Um, in this case, we're going to have a little mix of Python as well as a mix of HTML code. So you remember that every page, a basic HTML code, actually, if I go back, this is the basic template for any HTML website, period, right? So we set the doc type, you have the HTML set as language for English, you have a header section, right? And inside the header section, you'll have a title, that is the title at the top of this page. So for example, in this header, you will see templates, desk, flash documentation, 3x, this one is learning modules, this one is content. And if we were to look at this particular page, if we come up here to the head and then inside the head, you have all this extra information, but at some point you will see the one title in here. Let's see if I can catch it after looking through here. There it is, title, templates, flash documentation. So that's what you could set up here. Then you also have all your script information. So any kind of JavaScript we're using on the website, any kind of links over to style sheets or images or anything like that, that would all be stored in the head of your HTML file, all right? Then you have the body. This is your core HTML code, what you're doing for generating the content. So we see our body over here on the left and we can see all these div classes and that's breaking it up in different sections and chunks, all right? Then from inside there, we have our uh, HTML exit tag, which exits the entire HTML block. Now, the code that we got over here is going to look similar. So we have a title, and then we see some Python code inside of a template. Anytime you see a curly brace and a percentage sign, that allows us to set um, some kind of Python. In this case, we're going to use the block title. And what block title does is that allows us to pass in a different title for every single page. Remember, this is designed to be a template. So every single page will have a different title as it goes across here, right? Um, we can pass that through. And then we have dash flask R on the end. So it's always going to have dash flask R at the end. Then we relate to a style sheet. And for this one, we're going to look for our static file name called style.css. We are going to create a style.css file that will have all of our style sheet stuff in it. Then in the nav section, we're creating a navigation section at the top, which is think of it kind of like your header that goes across your page. So if I was to show you this one, for example, from Cisco, pull this over here. And I closed it, clicked on the wrong one. Let's go back here. Let's just use this one as an example. Um, and of course it doesn't have one. Oh, let's undo that. See if I can find you another one here. Here's a good one. I'm going to pull up a Lenovo website that I have open in another tab. So this section up here at the very top is going to be considered the nav section. And that always has the navigation where you can have your drop downs. You have your nice search bar up at the top. Logos is usually included in that. And then at the very bottom of the page, they have a footer that is on every single page that has all of this information down here. And the content, the stuff in the middle, is what we consider a content. And that dynamically changes depending on what page I'm on. So if I go over here to docking stations, notice the top is exactly the same. If I go to the bottom, it's exactly the same. But my content in the center here has changed. All right. So that's what we're setting up here. We have the nav. We're going to set up an H1, or so a header. And that header title is going to have Flaskar. And then we're going to create an unordered list here. This is like the most basic form of a uh, login form, right? 
So in this unordered list, we're going to have if G user, right? And G user is going to display their username, AKA they are logged in. If they are not logged in, then we are going to do this else statement, in which case we're going to ask for them to either register or log in. There's going to be two links there. Um, and we can see that the, by the LI being a list item, A is a reference to be a link. So we're going to have a link that we can click on. And the text for that link is register. So we have one for register, one to log in. No, instead of actually having the HTML URL here, we are using Python. So we got these double curly braces that is going to go find the URL for register and go find the URL for login inside of our project. All right. Same way for up here, it's going to find the URL to get all the way down to style CSS for us. Notice how we can do if statements directly in this HTML code. So we do a curly brace percent, and then we can do a standard Python check. And again, what we're doing is looking to see if G user exists. And that means whether or not they're logged in or not. If they are logged in, notice how we give them the path for logout. Else, if they're not, we do in. The only key difference here is inside a template, we have to have this end if, all right? So that's a little bit different than normal Python, but inside of a template, you always have to end your if statement as it goes down. It's not an else, but an end if. After that, we go ahead and close our unordered list, and then we close our navigation section at the top. Then we have a section that we call content, and this is kind of what I was describing over there on that Lenovo page. Inside there, we have a, quote, header section. This allows us to create a generic block of header text that we could insert right into here. Um, and then for outside of that, we have a message section, which is going to get fast messages. What that is, is anytime we had any errors in our code, if we look back at our auth, notice that we had the option to set up this error. And if errors exist, we would go ahead and flash that error. See how we have this flash error? What that does is literally flash that error on the screen, and we can tell the user that there's a problem with them logging in. Okay. Um, and then because we're using a for loop, if there's multiple messages in there, then we can go ahead and retrieve those and then put one on each individual line in its own div code. So we don't have to write this out for every single one of those. We're using a good Python method of doing a for loop in order to display that on the screen. And it will write out the message for each one of those. Notice the class of flash. That just means that we have a style inside of our style sheet that correlates to the flash, which is probably red. Um, and then it would go ahead and display that text. We need to end our for loop, just like we did with our end F. And at the bottom, we have this block of overall content. So we have a section in here called content, has a header section, has a message section if they have errors, and then we can inject whatever content we want inside. Notice on this particular base template for what we're doing in this project, there's no quote footer section. So there's nothing at the very bottom of our particular page. We can generate that later. All right, I'm gonna move this over here where we can see it again. Get this in here, let's make sure I get that third. There we go. All right, I know that's a lot to explain and that's the reason this class is kind of spread out over multiple sections. Everything I just explained is kind of explained over here in this text, all right? So we will kind of describe exactly what I did. I'm just trying to do it in an overall layout. All right, this is our base HTML. We then need to come back over here to our project and we need to create an auth register. So notice we go into templates, we need to create a folder called auth. And this is gonna to correlate to our authentication blueprint. Remember this one we set up here. And inside that template, we are going to go to our new Python, or I'm sorry, HTML file, there we go. And this will be for the registration page. So register, there we go. That first one was just our base template that every single one of these is gonna quote inherit. So we hit add, and then we're gonna go ahead and copy this code in. And notice the first thing it says is extends h base.html. No problem, Melissa, thank you. So what this is gonna do is pull in all the code that's in base HTML, and then we're going to inject things in those sections. So for this block header, which if we look back here, here is our block header, right? We're going to inject this code, which is called register. And then outside of the end block on our block content, we're gonna actually put a form there. And that form is gonna have the label of username, 
username displayed as a label input. We have that section, et cetera. This is a very generic form, but it's storing these as a particular name so that later on when we submit this, we can actually reference those names. See how we have form username. So inside of our form, which is this section here, it's looking for this name username. Whatever they type in here, that's what we're pulling out. We can also set tags that these are required. So they must give us a username and password for that to work. All right. And let's see here. We also have a login page. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, under auth, we're going to go ahead and create a new one called login. There again, we'll copy in our text here. And so the first one was for them to create an account with us. Remember when they click submit here, submit and the value of register. Um, when they do that, it's going to go back to our page and try to insert that into our database. If that user already exists, it's going to go ahead and then drop it um, out and say that that user is already registered and get us back to the registration page. If we want to be able to let them log in or we redirect them to a login, which is what this auth does, by the way, if they have one in the database, we're going to send them to the login page. Um, on there, we have the same looking form as register, right? The only difference, if you look at the text, is one says register at the top, the other one says login. And on the back end, instead of trying to insert it into the database, it does a select from the database in order to pull it out. So HTML looks very similar to the same. The only difference is, is one's a login page, one's a register. It does different things on the backside. All right. Last but not least, if we were wanting to test all of this code that we did, we can go ahead and click our run flask R up here at the top. We should see that this URL and everything comes up. That all looks good. We'll click on this URL link. It should take us over here to our page. I'm gonna bring this over here so we can see it. And then notice we don't get anything, right? Because remember, everything for this is under auth and then register. And here we have our basic little HTML page. I'm going to go ahead and full screen this. You can see it's not really designed or anything like that right now because we don't have our style sheet in place. So right now it's just kind of a very generic HTML text. Um, with this username, we can create one. So if I do JL Zeller and on the password, I say... Um, training, all lowercase, and then hit register. There we go. Notice how we got sent over to the login page. All right. And because we had no errors, no errors popped up here. Now I would be able to go ahead and log in. So if I logged in here and typed in JL Zeller training, and I got an error here, and that error is no endpoint index. Well, it's because we don't have an index page to redirect to yet, right? We never set up that page. So that would be our next step is to go build that index HTML and everything would work out fine. Now, what we could also check is if we go to register again and we go to username, we do JL Zeller because we're trying to register all over again. And I'm just gonna throw in a random password if I hit register, boom, we get our error that pops up and says that user is already registered. So that's what our error handling that we built into this page. Now notice it's not fancy, it's not in red, and that's because we don't have any style sheets applied right now. We haven't built them. So let's get to that next step. Before we do that, I'm gonna go ahead and stop my project. And notice down here, we're getting those 404 errors for trying to get that style sheet. So we're trying to do it, but we're getting an error because that page doesn't exist. We can also see that up here that we got a 304, which is where it's trying to redirect us on some of this stuff, and it couldn't do that, right? And we got this 500 error, that's because that page doesn't exist. Now notice when we got that error, it actually gave us a very detailed explanation of what went wrong. Um, normally that would not exist if we did not have debug turned on. Right. So if debug was turned off, we would just get a five HTML 500 error with nothing displayed there. 
All right, that's good to go. Let's go to Git. Let's go ahead and push up our changes. Remember to always do incremental changes. So here we set up our templates for base uh, register and login. Okay. One other thing I'll show you here in just a second. Let me commit and push this. And we'll push. Okay, that all went well. Let's go ahead and click on our project. If I come down here to my instance folder, remember this is where we store our database. Let's go ahead and double click in this database. And once it's all up, we can click on my user table. We'll double click on that. And notice in my database, I now have the JL Zeller user. And that is a password here. That password training that I had has been encrypted with the script algorithm. All right. And that is all what was done. If we go back to our auth page, notice that we clicked on this generate password hash. And if we scroll back up here to our generate password hash and mouse over that, it pulls the documentation that by default, it's using script. And those parameters are going to be pull it in there and it will go ahead and hash lib and script that file for us. If we wanted to use a different uh, hash algorithm, we could actually tell it what hash algorithm to use. We could also tell it uh, the salt length, which is the number of characters to generate for the salt. Um, it's really nice to get that salt length up pretty high. By default, it's set to 16. That makes it harder to crack this particular password. All right. So we can go ahead and close our database out. So we can start to see things come into our database. Um, if we wanted to, we could come in here to this user table here. And inside this user table, we could actually hand code our own in here. So let's do that one, leave it as generate. Let's put this in as Sam. And our script password, the problem is, is I can't dump this password hash in, right? But we can create that password hash as an example. So if we go down here to our Python console, And we go to our auth. We're going to go ahead and steal this from line, right? This is going to give us access to those functions that generate passwords for us. Okay. And so the one that we used was generate password hash. And then we need to give it some string of our password. So if we go to training and hit enter, it generates this script here. And then if we look at the output of this here, notice the easiest way, we're just going to look at the last couple combinations here. 463ED, if we go back to this user and we look at this password hash here, we go all the way to the right, we see that it's a slightly different one. The reason is, is I didn't use this particular salt or anything else that matched what our project is using. So in this case, it generated two totally different um, hashes and therefore those hashes will not match, all right? So we could generate ones. We just have to make sure that our project matches on the uh, salt length, as well as the method, all of that kind of stuff that it's bringing in there. But otherwise we could generate a hash. We could steal this hash out. Let's just go ahead and steal this out here and say we dump that in here for Sam, pass that in, make sure we don't pass in our hashtags. Hit enter, and now that's in our database. We could attempt to log in with that SAM user login. So let's just try that. I'm guessing it won't work, but we won't know unless we try. We would go to slash auth slash login, and we would log in with SAM and training. Let's see. And we get an incorrect username. Uh, let's try that again. Sam. Actually, this should be committed. Make sure this commit. Ah, oh, there we go. Submit. That'll go ahead and actually put the changes in the database. That's why I didn't find it. All right. So Sam. Training. An incorrect password. And that's what we expected, right? 
because even though this is what should be there for training, that's not what we're getting out of here. So Sam training, whoops, let's try this again. Train incorrect password. And just to double check on my console. Yep. So what it means is, is they have a, a different hash um, or a different salt that it's doing when it's generating that through. And we shouldn't see too big of a difference if we go to auth and where do we generate that password? doesn't look like it's using anything more than different there. So we'd have to test that a little bit and see why we're getting a different password hash off that same password that we're generating there. Um, we'd have to look at what's coming in on the form. That may be a different... Uh, there may be some extra stuff coming in there because if it's one character different, right, this hash is completely different. Anyway, that's above and beyond what we're trying to do here on this side. All right, so let me go in here. Let's go ahead and remove Sam here because we don't want that line. And we'll submit that change. There we go. And again, what I'm doing here manually is exactly what our auth code is doing for us. So this insert into blah, 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 that's exactly what I did by hand into the database. Okay. All right, so we're up and running there. We got our templates. Let's get through our static files here today. So the last piece that we're gonna talk about is our static files. Static files are something that doesn't really change, right? So the style of our website, et cetera, those don't change. Um, and we're gonna serve up those as basic files. Our HTML code is actually generated on the fly. Remember, because we have our HTML template here, but the end result of that is completely different based on what we come in. So for example, if I look at my login HTML, go ahead and start my server here. This is the HTML for the login page, right? Doesn't look like real HTML and it's not. When we serve up and we go out here to this URL and we go to auth login, This HTML that gets generated here is built on the fly from our web server. And we can see that we have body come inside of here and it takes our um, nav section. We have our H1 flask. That's what it was building in here. Um, when we're doing this section here, we go into our UL, we can see our library here of register and our auth. That's what these two built out. And then in, down here in the section of content, that's where we're actually building in the form, AKA what we see here. This part here, we have login right up here, right? So let's look up here. Login is set to our H1 title overall. That's where we have Flaskar here. And if we go to our base HTML, we can see that is this H1 header at the top. This login here is actually this one down below. That's where I was getting confused. That's this one here. That's putting this H1 header in. And then all the content. So it's generating all this HTML on the flight. Now you'll see an extra one here for Grammarly. That is my laptop that is not generally in there. It's uh, injecting that into the HTML code. So ignore that. All right. That all looks good. So let's do that. Let's go ahead and shut this down. And let's talk about our static file. So we want to style that because that looks pretty horrible when we get our login page. So to do that, we need to create a style sheet. So this static sheet needs to go inside Flaskar. We need to create a static folder. And inside that static folder, we're going to create our style.css. Now, again, because we are in uh, PyCharm, it has the ability to do these automatically. So where we see style sheet here, we'll go ahead and call this our style. And it will be a CSS file. And that way it will make sure that the syntax and everything matches for CSS. We'll go ahead and add that. And then we're going to copy all this out. And so I won't go into exactly every single one of these. Um, but what this is doing is for the overall HTML, we want sans serif for our fonts. Our background is going to be um, ease, which if you're looking for what does that equate to, you can actually see colors in here. So for example, that's white over here. Um, if you go to the font family and we say this color here, 
that is actually this color over here on the left hand side. So it's kind of nice. It gives you the different hex values, which will get plugged into there, right? Um, and we can build our own in here. So if we wanted to change the color scheme, you drag and change it, and it would automatically update this section. Great beauty of working with NPyCharm. All right, these are all going to be our different sections, the how much spacing, header, that kind of stuff. We can tweak all this. We're actually going to cheat later in this uh, week after spring break. Um, we're going to use Bootstrap for some of this, and we can make it look super fancy without having to remember how to do all this CSS code. All right, so for now, we're going to go ahead and leave that section there, and we will save this file, which it's in there. Great, and if we go ahead and start up our website again, and we click out to this link. Let's go to our off slash login. And that is a significantly better website. So it's now centered. Everything's nice and clean. We have this nice little nav bar where everything's kind of centered at the top. And we have a login section here. And if we wanted this login to always be centered, we could go back and modify our CSS code for that. So this looks dramatically better. It actually looks like a login form now. If we were to get an error on a user not existing, you'll notice that we now get a blue bar that shows up and it shows an incorrect username that's inside of there. And say we don't like that blue, we could always come back out here. We can look at where our flash is. That's this section here. And on this background color, which is this one, if we wanted to change that to more of a red because it's an error, let's go out here to the red. Let's pick something like that one. And it will automatically save if we refresh, continue. Notice how it's red now. So we can make some tweaks. We can play with our CSS to make it look exactly the way we want, which is what you guys will be doing in your final project, even your mini projects as you guys are working through them. And I encourage you to practice a little bit in your mini projects as that's going to help you when you get to your final project. All right. So that should get us through static files and go through there. Um, when we pick up here after the break, we're going to be talking about setting up the blog section of this. So once they're logged in and adding all the pieces and then all the functionality of add, add a blog, remove a blog, delete a blog, um, which are all different and, um, because one saves it, one doesn't um, on the backside. So I'll go ahead and stop the video here. We'll pick back up after spring break and we'll wrap this uh, project up, which will then lead us into our mini project that we'll start working on um, uh, next uh, on that week after spring break.